claim in our eyes because we created a slight different from what they are. When we talk, we see things are. Welcome to Strange Familiars. Bunny Man Stories. <laughs> if you have a story about anything strange, a bunny man, a flannel man, a toad man, a moth man. I would like to introduce a bombazine man. A what? Bombazine, the fabric. <laughs> oh, jeez. I don't even know what that is. If you've seen anything strange and you'd like to tell your story to us, we'd love to hear it. You can contact us by email, strangefamiliarspodcast at gmail.com. Yes, so, Bunny Man was not the original plan for this week. You didn't have a plan, though, did you? No, I did have a plan. Okay. I had a plan. I always have a plan. <laughs> you, you didn't just... have a plan for this week, did you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I develop a plan. The, the plan comes... Actually, I've had a plan for the past three weeks or so of which shows were going to be the next three shows which is unusual usually i just i have a catalog of different interviews i've done and i'll, I'll choose one randomly mm-hmm. but i have uh like i had it kind of planned out what the next three or four shows were going to be but that is not the case the synchronicities are dictating otherwise <laughs> so you had an interview with someone last week about a bunny man friday sonia mentioned bunny man and she was on i interviewed her actually a long time ago but Mm -hmm. her episode aired i think two episodes ago Mm -hmm. and then two or three episodes ago and then the last episode episode 94 i went on site with chad coincidentally chad wears buffalo plaid shirts before Mm -hmm. he ever heard strange familiars he wore buffalo plaid shirts wore one that day actually and he has a company. His company's called Ruck Rabbit. And he gave me a patch with a rabbit on it. Mm-hmm. An upright rabbit hiking. Yeah. Actually. But you had done a whole series of rabbits like that. Do you remember that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've done a bunch of, of rabbit drawings in the past. Like mm-hmm. Then, just a few nights ago, I did this interview with Aaron. I don't remember when that was. It was a few nights back. I want to say it was Friday night. Could have been Friday night. Friday or Thursday night. Mm-hmm. And uh, like I said, there's a pretty long backlog of interviews I have. So usually interviews don't get done Thursday and then go right on the next show. Yeah. That's very unusual to happen. Just because I do more interviews per week than than we do shows per week. So I tend to get get a backlog of interviews. So if you're waiting for your show to come up, it will happen, by the way. It's just... Yeah, or you just have to force a synchronicity to make it come (laughs) (laughs) up. Well, then we went for a walk. Two nights ago, right? Yeah, so, like like two nights after you did the interview. Right. And lo and behold, we're coming down the hill, and right behind our house... Is a bunny in the road. But it's not one of the, like, five million wild bunnies that we have, yes. or the baby bunnies that we have around that are wild. No, no, we have Red Lion, at least this part of Red Lion, there is no shortage of rabbits. We have wild rabbits everywhere, and we love it. I mean, we, we've we've always loved it. We like rabbits. It's a joy to see the wild rabbits around. We don't care if they if we're trying to grow something and they eat it. It's yeah, just, it's, it's the rabbit tax. It just <laughs> it is what it is. It's it's whatever damage they do. We'd rather have the rabbits around than not. We just we just love seeing them. Some nights we'll go on walks and we'll count rabbits. You know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But this was not a wild rabbit. It didn't have the profile of a wild rabbit, and it certainly didn't have the look of a wild rabbit. It was very much a domestic rabbit. Believe it or not, at the age of 48, with MS... (laughs) You were able to catch a rabbit? I'm not the fastest guy in the world. (laughs) Not usually the guy to run down rabbits. And I, I caught this rabbit. That's how tame it was. It yeah, was yeah. absolutely a domestic rabbit. Very people-friendly. 
I just put a little box over its head and we scooted a board under it and brought it up to our porch and we put some posts up on, you know, different lost pet places and contacted local pet store and vets and stuff. A local vet and stuff and did some due diligence. But it appears that we have a new member of our household. Yeah, she's ours now. <laughs> <laughs> it is an insanely cute rabbit. This rabbit is super cute. I mean, we've owned rabbits in the past, and they've been cute, but... Oh, I mean, I don't mean to I don't want to play favorites, but, but this, this is, one's the cutest ever. <laughs> oh, this is a cute rabbit. And it just, like I was telling you earlier tonight, I'm just heartbroken thinking about, like, yeah, what if we haven't found her? What if we didn't find her? Because she did not have... I'm saying she, she we, we actually don't know. Mm-mm. Uh, she or he she didn't have the survival skills necessary if if I could get you a dog could have gotten her easily a raccoon we have a big old owl that sits in the mm-hmm. tree out there I hear him I've never mm-hmm. seen him but I hear him uh, and she's not super big yeah she's no and she shows up in the dark pretty well <laughs> yeah yeah she's white and I'll put a picture of her up so the odd thing is, for whatever this is worth, is you know, I put it out there to the universe that I would, <laughs> I would like a puppy. And you had said a couple of days before a friend of ours had found the little puppy. And I said I don't want to make the decision to get a pet. I just want something to end up on our doorstep that we can't say no to. <laughs> and this is essentially what happened. Yeah, that, I never expected a rabbit to show up that way because like that doesn't happen. Like cats, you get that way. Right. Maybe a dog. Right. Right. I followed Juniper Fox. I think that's how they got Juniper Fox. The happiest fox. This bunny's a a people-friendly rabbit. It's happy now. We've owned rabbits in the past, like I said, so Mm -hmm. we know how to take care of a rabbit. So we'll give her the best home that we can give. And it's part of the family, I think, now. No one said anything. If someone did come forward at this point, I'd have some serious questions for them about why we found this rabbit in the way we did, because it's a domestic rabbit. It should not be outside. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's okay to take your domestic rabbit outside, but they should not live outside, not mm-hmm. even in hutches. But no one came forward, so I think uh, I think we have a new family member. Yeah, a lot of people were talking about how there have been so many people have moved recently on the street, and I wonder if maybe somebody just couldn't take them with them. Or They said that happens a lot. People dump rabbits because they think, oh, well, I saw another rabbit around here, so I'm they'll sure be fine, they'll yeah. be fine. And they can't bear the idea of, you know, either finding a new home for them or... Taking it to the SPCA or something, yeah. and then whatever might happen there, yeah. So they think they're doing the rabbit a favor by setting it free. The other thing that happens is we're... Far enough after Easter now where a lot of people get bunnies for Easter and then they realize, oh, there's this actually work to take care of bunnies. Yeah, it's and they start a little puppy. They start dumping them then. Mm. So who knows? Yeah, I'm not so many things had to happen for us to find this rabbit. We normally we haven't been taking nighttime walks. We were mm. doing it last year. This year we haven't been taking night walks. This was the first night we took a night walk. I said, Hey, let's go let's just take a walk. It's a beautiful night. We took a walk. We went up the hill. It, a couple raindrops hit you, and you just look, oh, I want to turn around. I don't want to get soaked, because we were out one night last year, and we got soaked. It was a pretty miserable walk. We had to turn around right when we did. Yeah. We came down. I don't even know that I would have seen her if this, like, the neighbor kid hadn't like left his lights on his car so shining right on her. He pulled up right as we walked down. If we were five minutes earlier or five minutes later, yeah, I, don't, I don't think I don't, we would have seen her. I don't know that we would have. I would have been scared, I think, about what it was in the yard because it just, she doesn't have the profile of a wild rabbit. I don't know. I don't know. You know, so many things had to happen for us to find this rabbit when we did. It's, it's quite wonderful. Yeah, it got very cold and rainy that night. I don't know. I hate to think of her being out there. I hate to think if we hadn't a founder, uh, mm. what would happen. So pretty amazing. Uh, it's, it's, kind of stunning when you think about it like everything that had to happen for us to find this rabbit when we did i you know enough time has gone by i guess since our our last rabbit that yeah it's almost it was almost four years to the day wow so the bunny comes in the wake of the bunny man story and the bunny man interview and and i was hiking with chad and the ruck rat his ruck rabbit thing and the pet she gave me and i'm doing research to be on the Echo and the Bunnyman podcast that I listen to. <laughs> yes. You're, you're cheating on me with another podcast. 
Speaking of Echo and the Bunny Men, certain listeners, TJ, requested, <laughs> <Is it one? laughs> requested that we play some Echo and the Bunny Men. We can't do that. <laughs> I don't know. So Dave said we could play 29 seconds of, of anything, but I don't, I'm don't. i not messing around with that. I don't know if that's true I don't or think not. YouTube thinks we can play 29 seconds. Yeah, of that's the thing. And then we get demonetized and this and that. But uh, what's the bunny's name? Our new bunny? Mm-hmm. Echo. <laughs> I suggested Hobo because we found the thing that was homeless. <laughs> Which is a good name. Allison came up with Echo. So we're going with Echo Hobo, which is a it's like first and last name. Like trash Latin. <laughs> Behold Bunny. <laughs> we will be talking to Erin coming up. She's got a really creepy, weird story of seeing a very, very tall man in a bunny suit in her house. And we'll be talking with John, who has a creepy story of a, apparently a just a real man in a bunny suit that he saw but just in a really creepy situation i'm interested in those as well though Mm -hmm. i want to hear about the if it's just out of place and weird and creepy but it appears to be an otherwise normal man Mm -hmm. i think like flannel man i want to hear about it Mm -hmm. you know it's just like i want to hear about the flannel man stories too where just somebody seems out of place yeah but it could actually be a normal human but they're just in a weird place or doing something weird not like these hypnagogic or hypnopompic mm-hmm. accounts that that people which I, I want those as well I want to hear about those as well but I'm very interested in you know these accounts where they appear by all accounts to be normal humans that just happen to be dressed in flannel or in this case a bunny rabbit costume puts a new spin on the Virginia bunny man case which we talked about on our Halloween episode and was that supposed to be like sort of the fodder for Donnie Darko. That they said that was one of the inspirations for Donnie mm. Darko, the the Virginia Bunny Man and the Bunny Man Bridge there. And we're going to cover that again. I think we'll go down to that area since your sister doesn't live too far from there, and we'll do some on site recording and we will cover that Bunny Man story again in another episode. But tonight, back to Echo and the Bunny Man. You're it- going to have to explain who all these characters are. Okay, so for um, case you don't know Echo and the Bunnymen, you might have heard their music if you had seen the movie Donnie Darko because it's the the song that's played probably the most often in, in the movie, mm-hmm. The Killing Moon. Probably have heard Echo and the Bunnymen at some point, right? <laughs> I think most people yeah. have. I think most people have. It wasn't really all that obscure, uh, but... Yeah, it was, it was a great band. I, it was, it was one of the bands that... One of your favorite bands that, that I also absolutely love. I think they're a fantastic band. So they're, we don't always agree. Yeah. Okay, so Echo and the Bunnymen are part of uh, my one of my favorite musical eras, which is the late 70s, very early 80s, uh, Liverpool, psych, new wave, post-punk scene. And one of the, the major people who um, figures largely in that scene is Bill Drummond, who you might know from... KLF. I don't know if everybody remembers that song from 30 years ago. Uh huh. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> but he was famous, like, he's probably um, most famous for having burnt a, a million quid and um, the song Doctor in the TARDIS. Did he really and, burn it? Like, he really did that? Yeah, he and his creative partner uh, burned Oof. a million quid. <laughs> Which is he what, like his, two point five million dollars, something like that. Yeah, I mean, I guess with it depends on well, what the uh, exchange rate was at the time. Yeah, it was a lot of money. Ooh. He even references that with when his kids talk about struggling, like the things that they could have done with that money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so but he's, he's a, kind of a performance artist then, in a sense. Yeah, slash magician, I think, and but not in that like um, I don't want to sound um, too judgmental, but not in that like sort of overly pompous like I'm a magician kind of way he's like he just I think he was the son of a uh, of a minister and I think there's just like a lot of ritual and intent he he grew up in this sort of magical way of thinking mm-hmm. and so he does a lot of things that are based on ritual and odd things seemingly like on this date I will bake bread for this many people and, or deliver this many pies and he and he sets out like this intent to begin with and makes signs based on it and then goes through with these pieces and a lot of them are very private 
But um, he was the manager for Echo and the Bunnymen and Teardrop Explodes and a lot of those early um, Liverpool punk bands. So he had a theory that Echo, who's of Echo and the Bunnymen, was not just their uh, replacement for having a real drummer and so having a drum said, machine. They said Echo was their drum machine. Yeah, and um, which was a thing that, like, all the, all those bands, like, they named their drum machine. Well, it was an important part of the band. That was so cool, though. Like, <laughs> like Sister Mercy had Doctor Avalanche and. What did Godflesh have? They had they called theirs like something too. I forget. I forget what Godflesh. There's a lot of keyboard based names in music, like the 808 State. Yeah, yeah. but I, but specifically these people like, who, like name their... their drum machines, and you know I always thought that's so cool. It's cool because it'd be like drums, and it would be. And then eventually they named their drum machine Pete DeFreitas, and it was innumerably better. <laughs> <laughs> But in any case. But at this point... So Bill Drummond says he doesn't believe, he, even though they're saying Echo is their drum he, machine. He thinks this is this larger archetypical trickster who's appearing in the records. Okay. So he gets a, a copy of the, the front cover for Crocodiles, which is what their first album. And this is what he says about it. So this is from Bill Drummond's book. Yeah, this is from Bill Drummond's book called 45, which was uh, written when he was 45. The photograph taken by Brian Griffin was of the band in the woods at night. The trees lit up. From where I was sitting, the photograph was foreshortened. I imagined I could see something in the picture that I hadn't noticed before. The four members of the band were all looking aimlessly in different directions. Les, the most central figure, was leaning against the trunk of an ash tree. The tree must have been coppiced at some time, because it had two primary trunks that had grown to twist gently around each other. I went out into the street with the sleeve of the record and asked a passerby, a middle-aged woman, if she would look at this album sleeve from a certain angle. What did the ash tree in the middle look like? The head of a spooky rabbit. What am I supposed to see? She had confirmed my suspicions. And he goes on to talk about how this kind of led him down a path at the library and research to try to figure out who Echo really was. Now, he doesn't believe that they know these archetypes and they're just not telling him, in other words. No, he... He he thinks that there's there's this archetype that's there that the band themselves are maybe not... Are are unconscious of, yeah. Yeah. Like, like they they think it's just a name a friend of theirs came up with and and they they don't have these sort of intentional magical practices involved in in it on any level there. It's just a kind of a name for them. Mm -hmm. So then he goes on to talk about... Later, I phoned Brian Griffith, the photographer. Without letting on about my secret world of Echo, the trickster, the creator, the watcher, I was able to ascertain from him that he had no notion of there being a tree on the cover with any visually symbolic meaning. Anyway, he reminded me it was not the shot that he wanted to use for the cover. None of us wanted that shot. It had been a compromise. Hmm. So it was sort of more of the unconscious Echo uh, revealing himself. And he, he thought of himself as sort of this trickster and he was the trickster rabbit. Drummond. Yeah, of Echo and the Bunnymen, tricking them into being the greatest band of the world, which is what he wanted them to be. And he even did the press for Ocean Rain and said this is the greatest album of all time and had them market it themselves like that. And then they sort of grew into... I mean, it is, in my eyes, one of the greatest albums. It's a great album. Great you know, album. front to back. Like, it's not one of those albums you ever skip a song. It works as a whole. It's, it's a fantastic album. He wanted that kind of uh, monumental magical rock and roll moment right right who's echo i asked will mack and les and they answered our drum machine with the benefit of hindsight i'm sure that with their answer my relationship with echo and the bunnymen started to take a dark and possibly dangerous path they were wrong echo was not the drum machine that was just an answer they made up to satisfy the journalists i knew even if they didn't that the real echo was something to do with the devil rabbit that balfit illustrated for the sleeve a character named Smelly Ellie had come up with a number of imaginary band names, including Echo and the Bunnymen. Will Mack and Les chose one. I never got to ask Smelly Ellie where he got the name or what it meant to him. It was about this time that I started to slope off and disappear into the library, the big one by the Walker Gallery in the center of Liverpool. I was on the hunt for real or even imagined information on who this weird Echo character was. I assumed the name the Bunnymen referred to his followers, so it was among those bookshelves marked weird, amongst religion, myth, tribal, that I was searching. The first thing anybody on this paper chase would come up with is Echo, Greek mountain nymph, and I quote, vainly loved by Pan, who in his wrath had her torn to pieces by a mad shepherd, only her voice remaining. There was something else about this Echo falling in love with Narcissus, but that sounded like bullocks to me. Didn't correspond with the illustration that Balf had done. 
The next thing I came across was a mythical hero of the Algonquin tribe of Red Indians of Northern Canada. His name was, and I'm going to butcher this, Kluskave. Do you know how to... Do your best. Okay. Kluskave is born of a virgin, fights his evil brother, and after the great floods, creates a new earth out of a piece of mud. He can take the form of a hare or rabbit to travel the world. His home is in the Northlands, where he remains to this day, struggling for the welfare of the world. This was more like it. Kluskave sounded like he'd got all his archetypes in order, and he'd got two Ks in his name. My search continued. There was a nomadic Siberian tribe with a rabbit spirit who in some way was involved with regeneration. There was more stuff from Viking culture, and from a northern island of ancient Japan, I found this. The concept of the trickster is related to that of the twin heroes, either or both of whom embody some of his aspects. A protean figure, trickster is a creator, but also cunningly devious and sometimes spiteful, sometimes too clever by half. He appears in both myth and folktale, forming the first world, recreating the earth after the flood, obtaining fire, creating man, causing his death and loss of immortality, defeating monsters. Where the creative role is assigned to some other figure, trickster's role as an adventurer is predominant, but even where he is the creative demiurge, he is also a joker. He is usually conceived of in theriomorphic terms, on the northwest coast as a raven, on the great plains and in the southwest as a coyote, in the woodlands as the great white hare or rabbit. It was over a period of time that these various strands of myth and folklore started to emerge and grow in my imagination to form one still vague entity that I knew to be Echo. And that is, again, Bill Drummond from his book... Entitled 45. 45. Which I see around often. You must refer to that a lot. I love this book. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's some really great writing in it. It's like um, part memoir, part like just little... goes from autobiography to little... Um, portions about different remembrances of Liverpool and maybe someday I'll be done with this Bigfoot book and I'll be able to read something other than Bigfoot <laughs> and maybe we'll have enough money we can burn a million dollars no <laughs> I, I'd sooner give to the poor yeah that was the major um, I think one of the major critiques of that that it could have been used to uh, much better effect yeah but in any case so does this sort of trickster archetype become more important to him throughout his life then? I mean, it sounds like burning $2 million or whatever it is. That's that's pretty trickstery, you know? He he has a very trickster quality to his... Uh, I think he has very pure intentions, but he has a trickster quality to things. I mean, that some of the books he wrote were... were uh, there's one called The Manual, and it's how to have a number one hit. And it was after he wrote the song Doctor and the Tardis, which became a number one hit for exactly one week in 1988. Oh, wow. Um, then they wrote this book about how to have a number one hit. And he's quite serious about it. Yeah. There's something very hugely symbolistic about the rap. And I think there is as well about the, the woodcutter. I think these are huge archetypes. We'll find out more, I guess, as we go on. They sort of inhabit the same area. Yeah, they do. It's only a matter of time <laughs> until someone comes up with a bunny man wearing buffalo plaid. Yeah, I'm sure. You know, this thing. You remember in the old Star Trek episodes where sometimes you'd come back through the, uh, what was it called when they would beam you down to another planet? The transporters or whatever. Yeah, the transporters. And sometimes there would be like a little mix up. They wouldn't get all of somebody, or they would get mixed with something else. That's what I think of, uh, um, even with a lot of paranormal activity, I feel like it's something like that. I think, yeah, yeah sometimes I think things don't quite... Like, they get caught. And, well, I mean, there's a great quote from a, a zoologist in Baltimore. So Josh and I, in the new, the upcoming, the forthcoming Bigfoot book, we discuss footprints a lot, because, you know, it's Bigfoot. Mm hmm, mm -hmm. And one of the strangest thing is three-toed tracks. They were appearing all over the place in the 70s. Uh, a lot of cryptozoologists would have you, have you believe they, they only appeared in Pennsylvania and, uh, you know, Falk, Arkansas or something like this. And they no, they were appearing all over the country, including California, Oregon, all these places where they have these great five-toed tracks now, mm -hmm. as we do here as well. But in the 1970s, they were showing this Baltimore... He actually worked at the Baltimore Zoo. I think he was the director of the Baltimore Zoo. And he took some interest in these footprints that people were finding every place. And he had this perfect quote. I think he was making a joke. But it ends up being this really kind of meaningful, perfect quote where he says, it's almost like 
when it was forming itself, it forgot to put all the toes on. <laughs> and it's like, it ends up being like this, the most perfect quote he ever could have given. Now, I think he meant it at the time is very dismissive. Like, uh-huh. you know, like, kind of like that, uh, that comedian that you like, who did the joke about Bigfoot. He said, what if he's just blurry? Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, oh, I can't remember. His name. Yeah. What if Bigfoot's just blurry? <laughs> this blurry creature out in the woods. And, and that's really scary. Mitch Hedberg. And uh, yeah, that and I was like, that's actually really kind of prescient in a way, like mm-hmm. that. And I I think the same thing. I think it's almost like it wasn't fully formed. It's indistinct. It's like um, something that's just coming into um, existence or just leaving. Yeah, and I think sometimes some of these things are are in a sense mashups in a way. You know, it wasn't but a few episodes ago where someone had what by all appearances was going to be a Sasquatch encounter and they their car got lifted up the back end of their car and they look in their rear view mirror and they only saw red plaid. <laughs> so that's, you know, it's just bizarre. The whole thing is bizarre, but, and that's the kind of stuff that used to irritate me when I was young mm-hmm. and, and getting into this stuff. Like that's silly, mm-hmm. that's silly, but now it completely fascinates me. So Aaron's account, uh, she, the bunny was wearing plaid. He was well, a, a lot of those, vest. a lot of those bunnies that you see in the like, the mall that are sitting with kids, they're wearing plaid vests. Yeah, yeah. So that's it's not unusual for that fact. They're I, not usually wearing buffalo plaid. They're she, usually she definitely wearing... made a, made a point of saying no, it wasn't it wasn't it's... red and black plaid. You can hear me pause though when she says it in the interview. She says it was wearing a plaid vest, and I just get very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have um, more bunny stories coming up in the future. Uh, if you've seen a bunny man a man in a bunny suit you know outside of a easter you know in a weird <laughs> situation that doesn't seem right i would love to hear about it i would absolutely love to hear about it in the future like i said we will we'll dive into more to this bunny man story from virginia which we covered on the halloween show we'll revisit that and i have stories about witch rabbits and graveyard rabbits as well from folklore which i will present I think we could even segue into Coney Island this way. Maybe. Maybe. Oh, you're trying to bring it back to circus. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there's so much rabbit stuff out there. Mm. And so we this will be something that... I think this will be another well. Maybe not as deep as the Flannel Man well, but maybe it will be. Well, I mean, just rabbit iconography in general is really fascinating. Just the way in which rabbits figure into a lot of... Even just... You know, things like the way that they used to used to be able to find out whether you were pregnant or not. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, rabbits were a common, which is familiar. Remember, we were talking about this, how bizarre it is to think of this now. How when you go to the grocery store when we were kids, there would be, like, little dyed fluorescent oh, yeah. rabbit's foot. Yeah. Feet. <laughs> yep. What's the plural of rabbit foot? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that. I'm, happily, they don't have those anymore. Yeah. I really wanted one, too. That's the thing. I had one. I didn't realize what it was. Yeah, I had one. We got it on vacation in Ocean City, Maryland. I remember. They're supposed to be lucky. Mm Mm-hmm. Why would it be lucky to have a foot of a dead animal? And what did they do to preserve them? How did that not... There's a whole bit of folklore, and, and I'll get into this with the witch rabbits and the graveyard rabbits. There's a whole bit of folklore with only certain rabbits' feet are lucky. And you, uh, you want to make sure you get the foot of a graveyard rabbit and not a witch rabbit. Because the foot of the graveyard rabbit is lucky, but the witch rabbit you don't want. But for now, let's get to Aaron's story. The first of what I think is going to be many. I, a bunch of people contacted me with bunny man stories. Uh-huh. Some wanted to come on, some didn't. Some will be on in the future, I think. But there are, like, it's a thing. People mm-hmm. see this. Kids see it, which is super creepy. Mm-hmm. Like, that's really creepy. If is that another case of, like, making fantasy reality? I don't know. I don't know. Like, if if it's something appearing to children and it's deciding to take that form, that's a very intentional choice, and it's super creepy. It's a super creepy thing to do. I don't know what's going on there. I think we need to dig in a little bit more. We'll have Aaron's story, and then we'll hear John's story after hers. We are talking with Aaron, who has a story I've been very excited to get because it's another Bunny Man story. 
So mm. Aaron, take it away. I'm I'm so excited to hear this. I can't believe there's more than <laughs> the more than a few of these actually. People keep contacting me. I can't believe it's a thing. Yeah, and the more I hear about it, the more I'm freaked out about it myself. Okay, so I guess I was trying to figure out where to start with this. And it was an actual Easter bunny sighting. Mine was actually on the eve of Easter. So, and I was about six or seven. I was in bed and I was trying to go to sleep and having a hard time because, you know, when you're that young, you're just itching to wake up and run and see what the Easter bunny or Santa brought you. Sure, yeah. So, I think I hear something in the living room. It's late. And so I quietly tiptoe. My parents are asleep and I come around down the hall. And um, the way our house is set up, as soon as you exit the hall into the living room, the fireplace is on the, the wall immediately to your right in the far corner across the room. So I just peek around because that's where we had set up our empty Easter baskets for him to fill. And I surprisingly see this, I mean, he had to have been a solid seven feet tall. He was as big as a doorway and he w- he had his back to me and it looked like the Easter bunny costume that they wear, spoiler alert, if there's any kids listening, that they wear in the mall for you to take pictures with. Mm-hmm. And it was an actual Easter bunny costume and um, he had his back to me and he was kind of bent over and uh, the fireplace was in front of him and it looked like he was sort of messing with the Easter baskets. And um, I, I mean, I was just barely peeking in the room and I saw all of him and I just remember thinking, wow, the Easter bunny is here. Holy crap. And he's really freaking huge. Like I didn't, I, I don't know how he gets in and out of houses, but I didn't expect him to be that huge. And so I was so excited. So I ran back to my room, hopped into bed, immediately fell asleep. And then the next day, we got up Easter morning, and um, our Easter baskets were filled. And I started telling my parents, I said, I caught the Easter bunny last night. I caught him filling our baskets, but I was quiet, so he didn't see me. And I turned around and ran back to the room and went to sleep. And my mom, it kind of caught her attention, and she said, what? And so I told her, I said, yeah, I, said, I, I thought I heard him. So I came down the hall, and I peeked in the living room, and I saw the Easter Bunny, and he had his back to me. And I was like, and he's so tall, Mom. He's so tall. And I, would, I just was going on and on, and finally, you know, the day went on. Okay, so then cut to years later. And every now and then, I would still bring it up. And my whole family knows, like, yeah, Erin thinks she saw the Easter Bunny, but she was probably just imagining it because she was seven and super excited about it, you know. Okay, so that happened. It's a very vivid memory. I was not asleep, and it's just a memory that I just kind of put on the shelf, tucked away, and was like, okay, well, that was that. I don't know what to do with it. I didn't think too much about it. Well, as I'm getting older, um, I'm 36 now, so my mom has shared with me through the years more information recently that basically her entire life she's been abducted. Let me just lay that there. I'm trying to figure out which order because it, it kind of all, it's kind of like a spider web and it all just kind of meets in the middle. Right, yeah. yeah okay. It, it's just tricky. Okay, so one day, probably about two years ago, I was going, um, getting my license renewed and I was just sitting at the DMV and it was packed and I had on, and I was trying to find it before you called. I can't find it. I'll look for it again though, but it's this Christian, uh, I think he used to be a pastor and turned scientist who became very interested in, um, abductions, aliens, and how it can, it follows family lineage and abducts, uh, the children and it just continues through the family. And I was like, whoa, this is really freaky. So I was listening to that. I have very strong faith. So I was listening to that on YouTube and just sitting there waiting for them to call my number. Then he started mentioning, he was saying how usually, you know, if a person's abducted, 
um, their entire life and then they get married, usually it'll carry over into the spouse. And then if they have kids, their kids will be abducted, whether they know it or not. Um, they might figure it out eventually. And then if they have kids and so on and so forth. And then he mentioned that um, he had someone report to them that um, every time they would get dropped off, the Easter bunny would be at their bedside and tuck them in and as a child after being abducted. And immediately my stomach dropped. I grabbed that memory off the shelf and I was like, no, 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 no. Don't this. Did I, you know, did he really just say the Easter bunny, someone else called the Easter bunny. And then he goes on to tell of more accounts of, younger kids when they're, I guess, being brought back or when they're being done, whatever is done with them, whether they leave the room or not, the Easter Bunny, and they they explained it the same way. It looked like the Easter Bunny costume in the mall, and the Easter Bunny tucks them in, or they, they see the Easter Bunny leaving their room or something to that effect, and large explained it to the T. And the more accounts that he told about, I started freaking out sitting there. At this point, I didn't care about my driver's license being renewed. I texted my mom and I sent her and she, she does not know. She doesn't have a YouTube account. She doesn't use a computer, um, any of that. And I said, Mom, you have to start listening to this. This is a Christian scientist. And he believes that basically aliens are demons just appearing to us. And we can cast them out and this and that. And I said, do you remember how I, I saw the Easter Bunny? And she's like, of course I remember. You talked about that all the time. And I said, go forward to this, Mark. And um, she started listening to it. And she texted me back um, later that day and was just like, oh, my gosh. Um, and she's like, I always believed you. But she's like, this is weird. So then I guess over probably about the last, I would say, eight or ten years, she's always pointed out or told me about her seeing a UFO at night. Or, you know, Erin, were you out last night? Did you see the large UFO by the moon and this, that? And I, I was just, ne I never saw them. No. And so after that, after I heard that um, YouTube story from the research, I was just thinking and thinking and thinking and I couldn't get off of it. And then I finally texted her and I said, Mom, have you ever been abducted? And her exact response was, I was hoping you would never ask me that. <laughs> yeah, and it just sent chills. And I was just like, here we go. And so I um, immediately stopped what I was doing and I called her. And I said, tell me everything now. <laughs> She was like, well, I mean, you know, I just, I was hoping that you'd never kind of put two and two together. I don't want to worry you. I don't want to scare you. She basically laid out, I mean, I could go for a couple hours and just really freak you out on, I mean, she's basically been taken since she was a child, um, along with a lot of um, satanic activity. So, so okay, your so mother relates to you that... She has experienced abductions multiple times then. Multiple times. And I had known about the demonic activity um, with her growing up. And, you know, that's a whole other episode. But I didn't know so much about her and her past with abductions. And um, even her sister, my aunt, corroborated it and I mean they actually saw one together and they told me the story last year it was the tall gray and it appeared in my mom's apartment and my aunt ran my, my mom called her and said get over here into my room now because they shared an apartment and my my aunt came from behind it and they're both staring at it it's blocking my mom's exit out of her bedroom and they're freaking out. I think they're, you know, like 22, 23-ish. They freaked out. They basically run past it and run out of the apartment, and they drive over to uh, their other sister's house. And my mom, to this day, still has abductions 
just not as frequently. And I think partly because she's had a hysterectomy. I think that has a lot to do with it. And then uh, there, there's so many pieces. Okay, so then I asked her not too long ago, and and I finally asked her, do you think I've been taken? Because I saw the Easter Bunny in our living room, and after listening to that podcast, all these abductees have seen the Easter Bunny after being dropped off, and they were taken or worked on or experimented on in their rooms or wherever. Do you think I've been taken? <laughs> and uh, she kind of went pale, and she just replied, yeah, I do. Mm. <laughs> and, uh yeah, and um, I'm just like, oh, wow, what am I getting into? Uh, this is insane. And so now I'm obsessed. And I was like, well, wh- what makes you think that? Tell me. She's like, well, you know, when we were, when you were little um, in the bedroom, um, it was a str- our, our hallway was in, the, in a T. So from the living room, you'd go down, and then it'd go left to my parents' room and my brother's room, and then a right to my room in the guest bedroom. And she would say that on nights of activity, sometimes when she would was about to be, because she could feel it, just something was off and she knew something was going to happen that night. She would wake up after being dropped off or woken back up or, you know, whatever it was. Yeah, however and it she was. would hear, yeah, she would hear like the, she said it was the pitter patter of a couple sets of feet running in between her room and my room just up and down the hall. Oh, that's so crazy. And, uh, yeah, that apparently went on for years. And then another time I was in my bedroom and I woke up and there was a full-size brown grizzly bear standing on its hind legs roaring at me. What? And, yeah, like, in my taking up the entire doorway. This is a memory you have. This is a memory I have, very clear. And my mom can vouch for this because wow. these are the two memories that I have being little and I couldn't have made this up if I tried. But this one did not look like it was in a costume. It looked like a real grizzly bear taken off National Geographic and it was on its hind legs roaring. And I mean, the top of its head was at the top of the door frame. So that's seven feet, uh, or I guess residential is six foot, eight inches. Uh, there goes the architect in me sorry so but (laughs) tall i mean took up the entire doorway and i screamed bloody murder and um i was about eight or nine so this is after the easter bunny and my mom comes running down the hall flips the hall light on and as she's running all of a sudden it blinks out and she runs through the doorway and it's like it was gone I said, Mom, you just ran through uh, the biggest brown bear. And I was like, I was freaking out. I was like, Mom, you just ran through the brown bear. You just ran through the brown bear. And so I'm telling her. And so now that I'm older, when I, now that she's to- and told me all this information, all these abduction stories she has, and um, all her UFO sightings, and now I can see UFOs as well. So that worries me. And and so, like, putting all that together, she thinks that those were screen memories that were given to me. Mm. I haven't heard anybody else with the grizzly bear thing, but, I mean, I've heard of, uh, like, Mickey Mouse and big characters, just something that the kids like. Right, right, yeah. And, yeah, so I saw the Easter Bunny. Wow. Now, when you say he was, you said he was tall, like real tall, right? Like, like seven, did you say seven feet tall, something like that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Is that not including the ears on the costume then? Not including the ears, no. Wow, so huge guy. Yeah. Comparative in size then to the bear. Let me see, I'm looking at a doorway. With the ears, a little taller than the bear but Mm -hmm. only because the bear whatever it was the screen memory the projection of the bear whatever i feel i feel like it was just made to fit exactly in my bedroom doorway okay 
and the Easter Bunny, when he was out, his he had the, I mean, they had the huge, fuzzy, fake-looking ears and everything. I mean, it looked like the costume, but he was also bent over a little bit, like at the waist, and he was still a good seven feet tall. So if he stood up, his ears would have been really close to the... I, I think our house... My parents' house is about a nine-foot ceiling, which is typical. Mm -hmm. So he would have been, the top of the ears would have been tall. I mean, it was huge. Wow. And was he very broad, too? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Take any Easter picture with the kids, you know, sitting next to him and how wide that costume is. Mm Mm-hmm. Actually wider, because I think those are body suits, and then it's just the head that's, like, real tough but it he was he was wide i mean two of me easily so a real uh, it was just huge big big broad guy and then do you remember uh, the, he would have made a hefty meal yeah do you remember the color of the costume was it you know like i know some of them are you know they're usually like um pastel colors but i don't do you remember the specifics uh-huh he had white fur and um one of the ears was what's the word it was kind of like a flipped down a little, almost like a dog's ears, you know, Mm -hmm. how it'll kind of flip down. And I remember being able to see like a little bit of like pastel pink on the inside. It was very, I mean, it was very cartoony and like a costume and he had a vest on and it was, um, it was plaid, not, not red and black, but it it was pastel plaid, um, stripes. And they, but they were going, they were making a diamond pattern. So they were like at a nine, at 90 degrees, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. And that's all I can remember. I want to say he had like a bow tie on that I could just kind of see, but I could just be putting that on there because that's how most of them are. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he so never, I, I can't say that for sure, but you never saw his face. He never turned around. No, he never turned around. He, he just, appeared to be busy and I assumed in my head that he was filling our baskets and I didn't want him to catch me because then I didn't think he would fill my basket. You know, you're not supposed to be awake when Santa comes and when the Easter bunny comes. So I was out of there real quick, but I stood there for a solid 10 seconds at least just looking at him and watching him. And I was like, okay, I I better go. And then I just went right to sleep. Like my adrenaline dump and everything, it's funny. I just went right to sleep. Well, yeah, that happens. That checks a box. Uh huh. And that's another thing that worried me too, because I was like, "Oh wow, that I remember that happening too." Like, how how was I so excited, you know? And then I see him, and then all of a sudden, I can just run back to my room and go to sleep. Yeah, just nod right out. Yeah, that's very very strange. Mm-hmm. Do you have any siblings? Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, Well, I had uh, my younger brother. He was six years younger. So let's see. I'm 36. He he would have just turned 30, but um, he passed away late last year. Oh, I'm I'm, I'm very sorry. Thank you. I mean, he's in heaven now, so better off than we are. Do you know if he ever had any experiences along these lines? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, He. The weird thing is. Okay, we always joke. My mom's Mexican and my dad is white. So I'm half Mexican and white and my brother's half. But we look nothing alike. We don't look related at all. We would always get mistaken for boyfriend and girlfriend and, you know, we'd be grossed out in the mall (laughs) and uh, all that fun stuff. And so he looks exactly like my mom and her side of the family and I look exactly like my dad and his side of the family. Let's see, my mom's uncle was a warlock and she had she grew up with a lot of demonic activity in her house and all the all the siblings her she has two other sisters and a brother they all eventually ended up in therapy and a couple of them have ptsd from it they'll admit to this day all the weird things that went on and it seems like it kind of followed it followed her bloodline and the UFO thing. I mean, her and her siblings had a lot of, I mean, they would see them all the time. They would, 
um, have missing time. I don't know if this is going to make sense, but because my, we always kind of chalked it up to everything. It seemed like activity was big with her and my brother and me and my dad are immune to it. Like nothing ever happens to us. We don't hear these things in the, in my parents' house when I was living at my parents' house. We never experienced seeing a shadow person in the kitchen or, you know, they always had experiences, I mean, monthly, and they would tell me, and I started always just saying, it's because you look like mom, like, it's just messing with you Mexicans, you know, (laughs) and it's leaving me and the white boy alone, me and my dad, you know, just kind of giving them a hard time, because we were never, I never heard anything, I never saw anything, thank God, but, I mean, her and my brother could just had story after story, and I don't know why it kind of bothered him more in my mom, but, and even now, now that he's passed, his bedroom is catty corner to their bedroom and there's still activity in his room. And my dad doesn't hear it, but my mom, it wakes her up. She said, it it sounds like there's like someone took a two by four and just cracked it in half. And it was so thunderous. And my aunt was visiting at the time, you know, um, helping my mom get through some stuff, you know, the whole ordeal. And uh, my mom called my aunt to the room and was like, did you just hear that in Garrett's room? And my aunt was like, what are you talking about? And she was like, you did not hear what sounds like just the biggest, like, two by four just being split in half suddenly. And she's like, No. And then about an hour later, my aunt came running into the room and was like, did you hear that? And my mom was like, hear what? And she was like, you didn't hear that, that same loud cracking sound that you were talking about? And she was like, it almost, it felt like it shook the house. And my mom was like, no, but here we go. And I mean, it's just constant, it's nonstop. That's really interesting. It's the idea that it follows uh, bloodlines and that it would follow to your brother, although, it, you know, I'd argue that it did follow to you. It's just maybe, maybe less so, or maybe you're just not realizing it in the same way. Um, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. But, uh, which is what I'm worried about. I, I think, I think it did. I'm just, I guess, fortunate is the word fortunate enough not to remember it or anything like that. Yeah. Um, at least not yet. Or maybe, maybe it, the activity wasn't, as much with me, you know, maybe for whatever reason, you know, I was just less of a target. Yeah. It's a weird question because, uh, you know, I had abduction experiences in the past and you always wonder like, okay, has it stopped or am I not remembering it? Mm -hmm. What is it? Cause you know, it seems like, seems like it stopped, but I don't, you know, I also, yeah. And I'm sorry to cut you off, but before I forget, Mm -hmm. um, my mom, my mom had said that it's, load a lot like in the last 10 years but she's still every now and then and she knows it happened because she'll wake up the next morning and she's exhausted she I mean exhausted she, her whole body hurts last year she was doing the dishes she was going to listen to her cat Steven's CD and it's almost exactly an hour long and so she put her headphones on and started doing the dishes and then finished the dishes she was like, oh, my legs are sore. The CD was, it was like, it showed that she had played the whole album on her phone, but she had just finished the dishes and that only took her like 15 minutes and she couldn't, and she was just trying to figure out like, well, wait a minute, how did I just go through the whole CD and I don't remember hearing these songs and the dishes are done because she was just, loading the dishwasher and she couldn't account for that missing time. Right. right. And that's, that's one of the more recent ones. Now, do you know if she considers the, like herself, there's no right or wrong answer to this, by the way, I'm just curious. Do you know if she considers the uh, aliens um, as demonic or does she consider them a kind of a separate thing? Her outlook has kind of changed. Now she leans towards them being demonic. Mm Mm-hmm. And I, I said, well, next time something happens, try and cast it away. Before she was saved, she thought that they were just an extraterrestrial, like actual life out there. And I mean, who's to say 
they're not. But then, yeah, we, we don't um, know. After, yeah. yeah, I mean, who who really knows? I mean, I guess we'll know when we die. Really, mm-hmm. I really don't think we'll ever figure it out. That's just my opinion. But so after um, I gave her that YouTube channel to listen to about the the Christian scientist who was studying abductions and how he's leaning more towards them being demonic, being demons, basically just presenting themselves. And he was saying, well, if they're extraterrestrials, why is it that when you call on the name of Jesus to, you know, take them away that they flee? Only demons flee from Jesus' name. Uh, why another person like if you if you said to me like Aaron in the name of Jesus like I command you to get out of my house I could be like mm, no <laughs> right right but if it's demonic and it answers you know to God then it would and so but so I've asked her I was like have you ever tried to cast it away when you're aware that you're not in your room anymore and. She, so my mom was saying that um, when she's taken, it's almost like she's, like, paralyzed. She can't move, speak, anything like that. And and she's not really conscious of it happening until it's done. Mm-hmm. So she can't consciously, even in her head, you know, like, say, you know, Jesus saved me, you know, right, right. or anything like that. And so I was like, okay, well, yeah, that could make it difficult for because I was like, we need to do a trial run. <laughs> next time you get abducted, you need to try casting it out. And she's like, well, I don't know, you know, when the next time it is going to be, because it has, now that she's, you know, in her 60s, it has, the activity isn't as much. But, I mean, I would say every few months, she still, she comes at me with a new little story. Well, the thing about it is, the prayer seems to work. Mm-hmm with these things to stop them, to get them away. I'm not sure if you heard me talk about it on the podcast before. I think, I mean, there's definitely like a belief component, a faith component. The interesting thing I find is, and this isn't to say any religion's right or wrong. I think everyone should have, you know, the, if you're strong in your faith, that's important. And I think that would serve mm-hmm. you well, you know. But uh, like, for instance, Jewish people have as much luck praying these things away as Christians do. And Muslims as Mm -hmm. well. So it's very, very interesting to me. To me, that says there's at least a belief component. Now, whether they're demons or something else, you know, I can't, I don't know what they are. I don't know what they are. But I do think that prayer is a valuable tool when it comes to these things. So if people, you know, people with faith, I say, and you don't want them around, go for it. Pray them away. You know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Because. And it seems to work. Yeah. And and so, so as a, so, okay, you know, us, being Christians, if we do call in the name of Jesus and um, they leave us alone, then that kind of answers our question, you know, is it an actual other being or is it demonic? Well, if it flees and, you know, when we call out to Christ, that just yells demonic. And who's to say, though, that there aren't actual ETs but there are also demonic beings that are appearing to us as ETs, you know? Yeah, it certainly and, could and be. And so, so there there could easily be both that exist. Yeah, that's the thing. When you're talking about these things, with whether it's technology or supernatural powers, when they work beyond our understanding, whether either way, like it gets to the point where it's like, yeah, of course, yeah, it could, could easily be that, you know, and why not? Why wouldn't you choose... What a convenient cloak! If they're really, you know, if it really is a demon, what a convenient cloak to wear, you know? If these mm-hmm. things are coming from from other places, other dimensions, whatever they are, it's it's a strange question, but uh, it's very interesting. You know, I've racked my brain, and I don't, I, I have no memories of anything like that happening to me. But I saw the Easter Bunny, so <laughs> <laughs> there's that. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for sharing your stories. Very, very interesting. Of course. Um, I'm, I'm so incredibly interested in this bunny man phenomenon. And uh, Well, I am too now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what, when, when Sonia told me and then a couple people, you, you being one of them, like, yeah, this is, you know, I've, I've seen this too. I was like, wow. All right. Now I need to get into this some more. So thank you so much. 
Oh, you're very welcome. Strange Familiars is brought to you by our patrons, without whom we could not do the podcast. Thank you so much, patrons. If you'd like to help us make Strange Familiars and get extra content besides, please check out our Patreon site. It's patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. You can get extra shows there. We do at least one full extra show of Strange Familiars every month for our patrons. And you can get other stuff there as well. There's different levels of support. You can check it out at patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. If you don't like the idea of a monthly subscription, you can help us out with a PayPal donation. A one-time donation, you can find the paypal.me link at strangefamiliars.com in the show notes. You can also help by sharing Strange Familiars on social media by giving us nice five-star reviews wherever you listen, and make sure to subscribe as well wherever you're listening to Strange Familiars. I'd like to welcome John back to Strange Familiars. Been a little bit. How you doing, John? I'm doing good. Glad, glad to be here. How's farming going? Going well. It's busy. It's hot, but things are going well. I'm trying to keep sane in the summer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's busy time, right? Now's the busy time. For sure, although, although I am leaving uh, in three days for the beach, so I can't really complain, so I'm oh. taking a little break. Nice. So you have a story about yeah. a man in a bunny suit, apparently. Yeah, I do, and this is probably a, close to 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago. Uh, I was just talking to my wife about it yesterday and trying to pinpoint when it was, but around that time frame, because my kids were still pretty small, yeah, we were coming back from my brother's house, and he lives south of, south of York here in a um, pretty secluded part of the region there. So a lot of backcountry roads, not a lot of other traffic. It was pretty late, maybe around 11 o'clock, if I remember correctly, that we were driving home from his house. And this was a pretty a main road during the daytime, but at night, not much traffic. So total darkness, no traffic lights, no other cars, no street lamps, things like that, farm fields on all sides. We were heading up the road, and, and up ahead, we could kind of see this sort of illuminated circle of something, and we weren't sure what it was. And as we got closer to it, and my wife was driving, so I was sitting in the passenger side. As we got closer to it, what we realized is that was it was a lit up, essentially, you know, and at the time, you know, I didn't really think that there was anything supernatural about it. I'm not convinced there was, but it was definitely creepy. There was a man in a bunny costume sitting on a chair, illuminated by light, and just waving slowly at us as we went by. What? <laughs> and, uh, I, yeah, it was, I mean, it was totally crazy. I mean, there was this moment of silence after we saw it, because we kind of slowed down as we saw the light coming, and we kind of slowed down a little bit, and then my wife kind of speeds up again. There's this sort of moment of silence where we were just sort of like, did, did we actually just see that? Thinking back on it, I kind of wish we had turned around and gone by again. But, you know, at the time, I just assumed that it was some crazy dude in a bunny costume who decided to string up a spotlight in the front of his huge open area yard at 11 o'clock at night and, and light himself up. So I don't, I don't know. It was, it was pretty... Pretty bizarre. Did you see the source of the illumination? No, we didn't. I mean, obviously all our focus was on the, like, the crazy bunny dude. Right. So it being a spotlight is sort of my assumption based on probably what my brain wanted to see, you know? Uh-huh. So I don't know if it was something stranger than that. You know, none of us forgot about it. My kids were very young at the time. My son was probably too young, and I he didn't remember it. But my daughter was probably like seven or eight at the time did remember it yeah we were all sort of like what the heck was that wow. So, <laughs> oh, wow and you know i never gave it much thought beyond that until you started having other bunny man stories popping up i had you know i would never have occurred to me that this was something that other people would experience or see right but, um what time so you this? i don't really remember but my thinking is it was sometime you know spring summer but not Easter. I don't think so. I mean, that that doesn't... I feel like that would have connected 
in my brain if it had been like, oh, it's a, it's an Easter dude. Right, right. You know, but I don't recall it. I don't, I don't recall it being Easter. Was this a no. a full costume with a mask, or was it with the kind with the cutout so you could see the guy's face? No, there was no face. It was a full mask. So full bunny mask. Yeah, full full on bunny man. And my memory is that it may have been, you know, gray or pink or grayish, pinkish gray, but it wasn't like a dark color. It was a happy looking bunny man. <laughs> It's so bizarre. So this is, I mean, this isn't far away from me then, I'm gathering. No, this would have been like sort of towards the brogue. Mm-hmm. A lot of the listeners may not know what that means, but I'm sure you do. So. Yeah. Wow. We could call him the brogue bunny man if you want. <laughs> You'll have to point out to me about where you saw him one time when we're going for a hike or something. I'll definitely do that. It's been a while. You know, I can definitely get you in the ballpark, but I couldn't tell you which house it was at this point. Right, and yeah. honestly, like, I'm not even 100% sure I, I could tell you there was a house. Like, I mean, I feel like it was in a, you know, pretty big yard, but, like, all we saw in the elimination was the bunny, the chair, and grass. So, <laughs> wow. And having that bright light there kind of made everything around it seem darker, so. Yeah. Uh, you got home on time that night? There wasn't any uh, funny missing time or anything? No, we had we had no weirdness aside from that that night. I have two, uh, it's kind of funny in talking about this the last day or two after, after kind of sharing it with you and talking to my daughter, who's now 17, she was relaying a related story that she remembered from when she was a kid. And uh, then that connected me to another similar story, non-bunny men related that, that I would love to share with you if you want to hear it. Absolutely. So my daughter said, in remembering the bunny man, she said, you know, I, she said, you know, I have this other memory from when I was a kid of being in the car And looking over into the field next to us and seeing a bunny person running at full speed, like through the field, like an adult sized bunny person running. And so I I asked her uh, for more details and she's like, really, that's all I have. That's all I remember is I just have this image in my head of seeing a bunny person running in the field and thinking how weird that was. Wow. But then that reminded me of this other thing that kept happening. There was like a couple, maybe like a month long period where we would be driving in the car places and my daughter would point out the window from the back seat and go, look in the field. And we would look over and at least two times, possibly three, again, in sort of random farm fields out in the middle of the field, we would see people walking, carrying suitcases. And it was just a really odd thing. Like if the first one we saw was this just one person walking with a suitcase, doesn't explain it. And then it happened again. And then it happened again. And so it was this weird pattern over this month-long period of seeing strange people <laughs> carrying suitcases across fields. Okay, wow. Which is not creepy in itself. If we saw it one, if we saw it one time, is not creepy in itself. But the fact that we saw this like three times within like a month-long period is pretty freaking bizarre. Never seen it since. And different fields. Different fields. One was like again similar, going down a country road and off into the field somewhere. You know, far enough away that, like, we couldn't see any features, but we could tell what we were seeing. I think the second one was actually we were on a highway. Yeah, I don't even remember where this was, whether it was locally, like, off of 30 or 83 or something, but passing a field and someone out in the field carrying a suitcase. (laughs) But I know the second time it was two people, like an adult, like an adult and a child, both carrying suitcases. What is that? Okay, I think we'll get more suitcase people now. I can almost guarantee it. Someone will, someone will email and say, yeah, I see people carrying suitcases in the fields. We'll see. Wow. Yeah, that- and you know, there's nothing inherently odd about someone walking along carrying a suitcase, but like the placement of it was I, I, like no explanation why someone would be walking through a field like that and then having multiple things, similar occasions in, in, with a short period of time was just, it's very bizarre. Yeah. Because after she said about the rabbit, the rabbit man running, I said, oh, my gosh, that sounds like the suitcase people. And she's like, yeah, the suitcase people. So that's like a thing that we talked about in our house multiple times. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. that's really interesting. Well, I'm, I'm getting interested in these, you know, sort of, I don't know, I guess they're normal people, but they're popping up in weird situations. A lot of these... Uh, flannel man things you know are they could be just normal people yeah you know that but they're just popping up in odd situations so this stuff is endlessly fascinating to me i think we'll get some emails on the suitcases 
I would love to hear that. But it is kind of weird with a lot of these, like, Flannel Man and even, even the Bunny Man, to a degree. It's like these weird, like, archetypes that start to appear in various settings. Why these things are archetypal, I don't know, but the Bunny Man thing just blows my mind that yeah. there many people have seen something like that. Yeah, and I, I really, yeah. like, the, so the Flannel Man thing I had heard about, at some point, not too long after Allison saw it, and I, so I knew it kind of was a thing that people talked about. But yeah, the Buddy Man thing is completely new to me. But apparently, there it is a UFO thing. Like people talk about a lot of kids, you know, have experience in conjunction with UFO sightings and so forth, seeing these Bunny Men. So this was a thing too. I just didn't know of it, yeah. uh, you know, well, beforehand. How far back do these Bunny Man recording? I'm going to have to check into that. It's still very new to me. So, you know, apparently the other guest that will be on this show, Aaron, she said that she watched a whole YouTube video from a guy, and he said it's very, very common amongst children who have UFO sightings and so forth. But how far back it goes, I do not know. Wow. Interesting. John, thanks for telling your stories. Yeah, yeah, happy to hear. Good to, good to chat with you, and hopefully we'll catch up in person soon. Sounds good. Well, Allison, do you think you'll be able to work Echo and the Bunny Man into every Bunny Man episode? Do you Absolutely. Think <laughs> Are there enough stories that'll fit? Yep. <laughs> no, I thought that that Bill Drummond story was really neat. I like I like the way he worked with the archetypes and stuff. And it's I think there's you know it all ties together in a sense. I love the idea that. It, th- the band didn't really think that that's what was going on, but he knew. <laughs> yeah, he, <laughs> they didn't know why they named the band that, but he understood. <laughs> I want to thank Eric C. for a PayPal donation. He's made several, so thank you once again, Eric. The sweatshirts, I think, considering it was summer, <laughs> yeah. were kind of a hit. The, mm-hmm. the silkscreen guy was like, wow, you sold that many in the summer. So glad everybody liked him. I think everybody paid except for one person who said they wanted them. I just went ahead and ordered one in that size anyway. So if, if you haven't paid yet and you still want it, make sure to contact us because we'll have a few extras for people if you didn't pre-order one. There's not going to be many. Like I think I ordered, what, four, three, or maybe. three or four extras, something like that. So uh, that was cool. And then we'll do... I think we're going to have Strange Familiar's t-shirts, and I'm doing a new Alba Twitch design for this year's Alba Twitch Festival. Alba Twitch Day. I always call it Alba Twitch Festival. It seems like a festival to me. It's Alba Twitch Day is the name of it. Thanks for listening, everybody. Just a reminder, we can always be contacted by email, strangefamiliarspodcast at gmail.com. Strangefamiliars.com is where you can find us. We will return next week with another episode of Strange Familiars. Strange Familiars is a production of Dark Holler Arts. Music, books, art, podcasts, and more. DarkHollerArts.com Intro and background music is by Stonebreath. Stonebreath.bandcamp.com for more. We are on Facebook, facebook.com slash strangefamiliars, and you can join the Strange Familiars gathering group there as well.
Show.